Our faculty is immensely proud of our strong international research profile, pr proud of our profile as a research powerhouse in business and economics. Uh, and it was with a view to showcasing that expertise that last year our previous Associate Dean for Research, Professor David Grant, inaugurated this power, Powered by Research Breakfast series. The fact that we're gathered here today is due in no small measure to David's inspired leadership in that all-important research portfolio. And he too sends his regards from abroad. He's currently enjoying a well-deserved study leave over in the mother country. So before you get down to breakfasting, <clears throat> the serious business of breakfasting, let me take a moment to introduce our Master of Ceremonies for today, Wayne Lonigan. Wayne is Managing Director of Lonigan, Lonigan Edwards and Associates uh, and is the leading expert in Australia in the area of corporate and business valuations, about which I know absolutely nothing, but I'm sure I'll know a lot more by the time this presentation is finished. Wayne has held numerous statutory and professional appointments, including memberships over many years of the Companies and Securities Advisory Committee, the Australian Accounting Standards Board, and the International Accounting Standards Subcommittees on Financial Instruments. He has also held numerous senior roles in the Securities Institute of Australia. Most importantly, though, from our perspective, Wayne is an adjunct professor in accounting in our faculty. He's an immensely highly valued member of our faculty board of advice uh, and is the generous donor of the faculty's two most prestigious annual teaching prizes, very sought after prizes. Look, Wayne is the obvious choice to be today's Master of Ceremonies, um, and I'm so pleased that you're with us this morning, Wayne, and thank you for agreeing to do the honours. So, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy our breakfast hospitality, and once you've had your breakfast, Phil, Wayne, Graham, and the members of our panel will offer you food for thought, a feast of food for thought on auditing and auditors. So, please enjoy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just while we're finishing breakfast, um, uh, my name's Wayne Lonergan, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. Professor Graham Dean will deliver his paper um, to you, and then there'll be some questions from the floor and questions and discussions with the panel. Graham's been with the faculty for 36 years. He started at the age of seven um, <laughs> and has done some absolutely outstanding research. Uh, you'll find a, a lot of commentary in this very nice book that you'll get when you leave about the speaker, or the speakers in fact, because his colleague Sandra will be speaking at the end of Graham's presentation. I won't go through the CVs of everyone because frankly we've only got an hour and a half and there just isn't time to go through all their achievements. Um, Graham's most recent um, major work was delightfully called Indecent Disclosure, um, which is one of the more popular text um, readings for his students and is read by every student in the faculty, probably not altogether for the right reason because they don't appreciate that the actual title of his paper is Indecent Disclosure, Gilding the Corporate Lily, which gives a slightly different impression about the contents of the article that he so recently had published and uh, received an award for, a prestigious award. I'll say no more about Graham. I'll hand over to him. He's done some fabulous research in the area of corporate failures and the role of accounting in failures, and, uh, and I'll leave the rest to him and to Sandra. Thanks, Graham. Thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, I hope that the people that have come here this morning at such an early time get some value out of the next uh, 65 minutes or so that we're going to have. Just the structure of my talk, uh, I will provide approximately 15 minutes overview of some of the current, what I believe are major issues facing the accounting profession, regulators, and uh, dare I say it, us, investors, and others, employees, having dealings with corporate groups. The focus is corporate groups. Uh, after the 15 minutes of my presentation to introduce the issues that I think are pertinent, I'll call upon Sandra Vanderlaan sitting at the table. Sandra is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney. She did a PhD looking at issues related to deeds of cross-guarantee. 
uh, a strange sort of notion uh, in commerce. Strange, I say, because whenever I talk about deeds of cross-guarantee, whether it's to academics or whether it's over a beer with practitioners, the understanding of the implications of these deeds of cross-guarantee, which have been in Australia's commercial lexicon since 1985, <coughs> appears to be fairly limited. So, and hence, that's why Sandra did a PhD in that area. She received the PhD uh, last year, and she's going to provide four or five tables from the PhD looking at some of the data about deeds of cross-guarantee and tax consolidation on a group basis. Uh, and it's interesting, the comparison in that data, so I'll leave that to Sandy. I have four main points that I want to canvas in the talk, and I hope to raise several questions as I move through those four points. I hope I'm controversial. I hope you're going to ask me some questions later, and I hope the panellists get stuck into me as well. There won't be much evidence. I'll be making a lot of claims and assertion, but there is a lot of evidence to back up those claims. And you will receive some of that evidence when you pick up your bag as you leave. So the benefit of coming here is you get some really nice data that's just been published. For example, the Australian Accounting Review, which is a journal published out of our university, but it is an international accounting journal that seeks to publish articles at the interface of uh, the academy and practice, has just published two pieces of recent work that I've been involved in, one with Sandra Vanderlaan on corporate groups. And in that particular paper, we talk about the state of play of corporate groups in Australia, describing, it's a descriptive paper, there's no regression analysis, there's nothing that's going to turn off practitioners, it's simply giving you an idea how many subsidiary companies are, for example, in News Corporation. You'd have a pretty good guess, 1,400 or 1,350, Harvey Norman, something like 1,000. It goes through an analysis of the composition of the subsidiaries and the nature of whether they're wholly owned or not and so on. So she'll talk a little bit about that. And that's in this particular issue, which will be in the bag that you'll pick up. The other paper that's published in this issue is a paper on fair value. I'm sure at the heart of most practitioners at the moment is fair value accounting and mark-to-market -market accounting. And in this particular journal, Professor Clark, who when uh, John Shields introduced me as probably uh, the leading light on company failures and the analysis of them and the role of accounting in company failures. Well, I think you probably missed the mark there because I think Frank Clark is probably the leading light and I'm the, I'm the two I see, sort of giving him a hand. Uh, and we actually owe so much to our mentor, Ray Chambers, who actually made statements in 1973 in a book, Securities and Obscurities. What a great name, right? Securities and Obscurities. And the subtitle was fantastic because it was the reform of the law of company accounts. And basically his proposal back in 1973, which Professor Clark and I operationalised in two books, Corporate Collapse and Indecent Disclosure, in 1997 and 2007, has not been implemented by regulators, and they obviously have their reasons for that. Probably haven't read the book, but uh, maybe they have. Um, but interestingly, and I'm going to come on to my first point here now, accounting remains in chaos in general, a fairly controversial statement, and in particular that creative accounting, this is even more controversial, is more the consequence of complying with the pre prescribed accounting standards than deviating from them. Of course, a true professional is certainly constrained by standards, but does not have to follow the standards if, in fact, by following the standards, a true and fair view will not be satisfied. Now, this tension that exists between having to follow the standards because they have the force of law, but having because of the Corporations Act to ensure that the, the accounts provide a true and fair view is something that is really at the forefront of a couple of cases that are going on at the moment, in particular in the United Kingdom, the, the case with Lehman Brothers and the repos 105s, and whether or not following what was standard industry practice is going to be sufficient to get the company, the firm, off the hook. Uh, and, of course, to follow that one up, I'm not naming the firm because there but for the grace of God go the others because they would, would have been doing, I'd imagine, roughly the same. Um, that was a point made by Professor Clark when we had to appear before the 
uh, joint committee on corporations and financial services that debated True and Fairview back in 2004-05. Uh, and Professor Clark was asked uh, what happened with Arthur Anderson. Uh, was that uh, unique? And he made that statement there, but for the grace of God, and it's in Parliament, it's in the Hansard, that the others could have equally uh, suffered the fate of Arthur Anderson at the time. So there may be controversial claims that we're making, but uh, the, the issue about whether you have to follow the prescribed accounting standards is some, it's a vexed question, and it's a difficult question. And we spend a lot of time in our book, Indecent Disclosure, looking at that particular issue in chapters four and five of our book. So if anyone is really interested in our take on that, I'm very happy if you leave your uh, card uh, at the desk and I'll provide you those two chapters that I have digitised uh, to, to at least give you the reasoning that we have uh, and we'd be very happy to provide to you. I just want to step back a little bit and put this in context because the next two points, the existing use of corporate groups is probably ungovernable and the audit of complex corporate groups is mission impossible has resonance with respect to the latest legis or one of the latest pieces of legislation that impact on corporations, and that is the Corporations Amendment Bill Number no. 6, 2010. Pretty long, sort of interesting title. You'd have thought they could be a bit more uh, descriptive than that. But of course, what does that refer to? You'll get that information in your uh, brochure or booklet or whatever we've got out there, bag that you pick up as you leave. That's looking at the issues of how to determine dividends and whether it's on a profits basis or a solvency test basis. The legislation that's just been enacted is suggesting that we move away from the tried and true, uh, uh, the proven, tried and proven method of determining profits, uh, determining dividends based on profits and move to a solvency based test. In principle, what could be wrong with that? Assets exceed liabilities, the company's solvent, they're able to pay a dividend without reducing capital, one mightn't have a problem with that. Well, Charles Luttrell, where is Charles? Here he is sitting here. Charles Luttrell would have a problem with that as a regulator for APRA because APRA, when it determines solvency, solvency, regulatory solvency, in order to ensure that insurance companies and others can be solvent, have buffer, have a capital adequacy, what do they exclude from their assets? All of those assets that the accountants in this room are trained to be able to provide provision for deferred tax debits, goodwill on consolidation, all of those items that are basically bookkeeping debits simply to make the books balance. There is no external referent, there is no cash related to those items, and how they can be used in order to assess solvency beggars belief. That's a fairly controversial statement. But that's the solvency test that's in the Act at the moment. Assets exceed liabilities, hence you're able to pay a dividend. I believe there's going to be some very interesting discussions about that test over the next two or three years as, we, as practitioners we try and implement that. How does that relate to groups? Groups don't pay dividends. Entities pay dividends. Legal entities pay dividends. Consolidated accounting information, which is now the prescribed and for many groups the only financial statement information that is going to be available is not the information you would need in order to determine the payment of dividends. That must be at the parent company level, the subsidiary company level, not the consolidated level. The response I'll get, and I'm rushing, the response I'll get is if all the companies are wholly owned, this is not a problem. But there are employees in some of these companies. Remember the Patrick Waterfront dispute and the way in which subsidiary companies were strategically used, I will allege, strategically used in order to quarantine assets in companies that the employees were not contracted with. The James Hardy case, another interesting case. I don't want to go into too much detail there. That's still before the courts for the directors. But entities pay dividends. They have to be legal entities. We need data about those legal entities for the community to be satisfied about the payment of those dividends. Under the Corporations Amendments Bill No. 6, 2010, parent companies no longer will be required to provide financial statements. Information about total assets, current assets, profits will now be provided as a note to the accounts, that is the consolidated accounts of the group. This is where we move into deeds of cross-guarantee. We no longer have parent company information. 
on a financial statement basis. If that same group has a deed of cross guarantee in place and all of the subsidiary companies are in the deed, we have a situation where now, because of the deed, the quid pro quo benefits uh, to the companies taking up the deeds, the directors when they execute a deed, they do not have to provide subsidiary company accounts. And in the listed companies in Australia, Sandra will provide some data, but approximately the top 100 companies, 60% of companies have deeds of cross guarantee. So 60% of the companies will now have a situation where they don't provide subsidiary company information, they don't provide parent company information, they only provide consolidated accounting information. Let me now move very quickly because I have a lot of slides here with I'm going to run out of time and I don't want to talk about them, but I've got some terrific slides on research because I was going to bag academics about research and give you a couple of quotes. But at the end of the day, my point about research uh, is taken in, from this particular line here. It was a, a line thinking that's research. And that's what I'm trying to do here today. I'm trying to look at what data we have, as Sandy will show you, what implications there are in respect of current legislation relative to that data, and then ask the question, does what the legislators have recently implemented solve some of the issues that that legislation was supposed to address? What was the legislation addressing with dividends? It was suggesting that companies could not pay dividends under the current IFRS regime because of requirements to satisfy fair value accounting. You had to take into the profit changes in the fair values of assets and liabilities, which previously you didn't have to. And they were saying that was constraining. So it was a sort of a political or a compromise that we got this legislation. Well, my, my proposition is that we're probably going to be in no better position once we look at what's really entailed in the, in the solvency test in respect of that matter. So Chambers was, was keen to point out that real researchers should be thinkers. They shouldn't be data driven. Data should be related to problems. You get the data and you re, if you like, redefine what the relevant problem is in order to try and resolve the problem. Accounting academics, um, as suggested by Bob Sterling, who died a couple of weeks ago, he was a colleague of Chambers, Bob Sterling used to talk about accountants being terrific at recycling problems. They never resolve them. And so look at the big picture accounting, conceptual framework. I'm old enough to know, what did you say? Who was that person? Wayne, you said I've been 36 years. That takes me back to about 1974. The FASB in 1974 was just starting the conceptual framework program. And by 1978, I think they had five or six concept statements. What are we doing at the IASB and the FASB now? We have a joint project on the conceptual framework, 36 years later. You wouldn't be too happy if you were a, <coughs> a patient waiting for the medicos to resolve their problems as quickly as uh, we seem to be doing as accountants. So thinking is what it's about. Let me move forward quickly. I've looked at a number of areas which, that have informed my position uh, that I'm presenting today. And in the area of, of groups and deeds of cross guarantee, for the last 15 years through an ARC grant and related research funding, I've attempted to identify which companies in Australia have got deeds of cross guarantee, what happened to them when they went into liquidation, what payout rates did they provide to their creditors as a result of the deed, in order to get a feel for whether or not this uh, arrangement, this regime was working. And a few interesting things that, are, that I identified from that research has implications for the sort of work that Sandy has done, and in particular, the supposed um, offsets to the benefits that companies would get if they took a deed up. Uh, that is that they would have to provide group security, pooled asset security for the creditors, because the creditors no longer got all of this information about the subsidiary companies. Well, that never happens because companies never go or rarely go into liquidation. They go into voluntary administration. And the deed covenants are only executed, it's not the right word, I just can't think what the word is, but uh, um, crystallised as well. Done, this man's got me, right? The, co the, covenants, the covenants are only crystallised upon liquidation. So that becomes an interesting situation that the companies never have to give up any costs in order to get the benefits of the reduced reporting requirements. Why is this an issue? 
If, again, I'm not quite old enough to go back to 1844, but in 1844, the UK General Incorporation Act was the act that really set the scene for the current regulatory regime for companies. And at that time, companies were able to register with the Department of Trade or the relevant uh, body at that time, generally to incorporate and get the benefits of being able to sue and be sued and, and perpetual succession and so on. All of the benefits that you wouldn't have as an individual, as a sole trader. But at that time, they were adamant that you had to give up something. So incorporation entailed publicity disclosure requirements. And again, chapter two in our Indecent Disclosure discusses this at length because it's not discussed very much today because it's perceived to be so far in the past that it's no longer pertinent. I, I dispute that. Incorporation has the same implications today as it had before. Whether or not you've got fancy corporations now and you've got trust interposed with corporations, you've still got the basic corporate form as the driver of commerce. And in fact, corporate groups, and Sandy will show this very definitively, corporate groups are the main drivers of big commerce, the big end of town. Let me quickly get on to something said by someone else, because you've probably heard enough of me already. Recently, we had Justice Neville Owen, who was the HIH Royal Commissioner. Uh, he gave a public lecture at the University of Sydney, and before that lecture, I had the, uh, the privilege of interviewing him, and I've extracted four minutes of that interview looking at issues about governance. I've got four minutes left, they just said to me, right? So you're gonna get it, right? He's talking about governance, and he's talking about auditing of complex groups. The first question I asked him was, do you think that the concept of the corporation is as valid today as it was before, or do you believe that corporations are inherently ungovernable? Welcome to Sydney University, Justice Owen. Um, Thank you very much, Graham. We're delighted that uh, you've agreed to the public lecture tomorrow evening. So I'm not sure that I agree that the corporation itself is ungovernable, but I, I am very concerned about the use of corporate groups. For example, um, the HIH group consisted of well over 200 companies. The Bell Group uh, was, I think, 83 companies. We had, we've, I've had things such as directors not knowing that they were directors of individual companies within the group, all those sorts of things. I think that's where the problem lies. Uh, I wonder, just a, a final point, just to extend that just a little bit into the auditing uh, context. Given the complexity of transactions between related parties, uh, and given the amount of documents ex post when a company goes into liquidation and comes before the court in some dispute situation, what is your view about a claim that uh, a colleague of mine, Professor Clark, and I made several years back that the audit of those corporate groups has also become nearly a mission impossible for I'm, auditors? I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry from a commercial perspective and a community perspective, I'm sorry to say I agree with it. Mm -hmm. I agree with your, your comment. The, uh, the intra-group transactions are so complex and particularly when you add in things such as joint ventures, mm -hmm. where some are, some are wholly owned and some are part owned, mm -hmm. some are genuine, there are genuine third party interests and there are manufactured third party interests. Um, there are arrangements with uh, suppliers of services, particularly financial services, uh, which are documented in numerous ways. I think it's very, very difficult uh, to have an audit system that is going to fulfil the expectation which seems to have arisen. I'll leave it at that point. The expectations gap is a major issue that we could discuss and it relates directly to groups as well as to issues of true and fair view. But Justice Owen, in that interview, the longer interview, which is on the University of Sydney's web, web page, it's a 15 minute interview and probably gives you a a much uh, better embellishment of, of his argument. His argument clearly I put there because it supports the argument of Frank and myself. But where have we got our evidence to make that claim? And very quickly, corporate collapse looked at many corporate crashes in Australia from the 1970s, 1960s 
through to 2000. And of course, they, we drew upon inspectors' reports. We didn't draw upon newspaper articles. We drew, drew upon the ex post analysis that the inspectors had drawn up compared to what had been reported. So it was a beautiful control study. You had the reported data and you had the inspectors' reports redoing or restating the accounts. I'll, I'll stop at that stage because I want to now call upon Sandra Vanderlaan, who's going to talk about AS, uh, ASIC deeds of cross guarantee. And the, the issue that we're going to talk, try and show here is the complexity of the structures. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I've just got a few slides um, from the paper that was um, or will be in your packs as you leave the door. Just, uh, I'm just basically giving you, uh, or trying to give you a bit of an idea about what the nature and extent and scope of listed companies in Australia, in other words, what they look like. Or I should more, in, more importantly say listed groups, because on the whole they're listed groups. Um, so I did this as a, basically a preliminary, preliminary to my PhD research, and I did a survey as at June 30th, 2007, which you'll note um, is probably before the worst of the crash, but it, it really gives uh, a good flavour of what corporate uh, Australia or listed corporate Australia looks like. So as at the 30th of June 2007, we had 100 and, uh, 1,526 domestic listed companies. And I've got companies underlined there because um, everybody will know there, there's more than that, list, that number listed entities on the Australian stock market. Um, I don't know whether you know or not, the Australian stock market's the seventh largest in the world. So it's um, got quite a deal of economic significance, but the remainder of those companies are uh, foreign companies, uh, foreign entities, or listed managed investments, or trusts, and things like that. But of that 1,526, only 183 were not corporate groups which, um, well, that came as a little bit of a surprise to me. And the larger companies are far more complex. So the top 150 companies averaged 62 controlled entities. And we have to bear in mind here that the Australian accounting standards now don't require you to list in your financial reports all your controlled entities. You only have to list your material controlled entities. So there's a lot of uh, companies operating on the stock exchange that would have more than that, but because they're not material, they're not listed. Um, and those controlled entities are incorporated across the, the subsidiaries, are incorporated across 143 jurisdictions, and 72% um, of that, 72% um, of those controlled entities are actually incorporated in Australia and uh, they're largely wholly owned subsidiaries or controlled entities. So uh, the main point of what I was going to speak to you th about this morning is uh, basically corporate groups versus separate legal entities. And there's two main ways that the, regulator or, um, the regulators interfere through the Corporations Act um, with the, the, the doctrine of separate legal entity. And the first one is the ASIC class order deed of cross guarantee, which is what Graham spoke about earlier. And um, the ASIC class order deed of cross guarantee, as he said, is a regulatory instrument that companies can in, um, enter voluntarily and if you have a wholly owned entity or even today you can have a partly owned entity if you enter a cross-guarantee arrangement, you, the subsidiary doesn't have to produce financial reports and the quid pro quo is that the parent entity um, and the other entities involved in the cross-guarantee, they have cross-guaranteeing arrangements upon liquidation. The other main way of interfering with the separate legal entity doctrine legally is tax consolidation, so consolidating tax groups, which is slightly different because um, the interesting part about the deed of cross guarantee is that companies can enter and leave at will, and or at will, under a certain um, arrangements. Whereas with the tax consolidation, once you opt for tax consolidation, you must remain tax consolidated, 
and additionally with tax consolidation it has to be a wholly owned Australian entity. So just going on, as Graham said, I'm going to show you a few tables here and these are in the paper that's in the pack. Um, but as you can see, I had my uh, 1,526 companies and listed co entities on the uh, listed companies on the stock exchange. 15% um, of them had a cross guarantee or had some sort of cost guaranteeing arrangement. And you'll note that the top decile, the top 150 com companies, more than 50% have cross guarantees. Um, and as you go down. Um, through market capitalisation, it gets less and less and less. Um, that was already um, an interesting finding. There's about 10,000 of these cross guarantees in place across the corporate sector in Australia, um, you know, for uh, proprietary companies and what have you. But 235 of the listed companies have cross guarantees. And. Um, I split it up to, energy, uh, to different sectors to just see whether or not there was a preponderance if you were in a particular sector that you might choose to adopt a cross guarantee to see if I could find some sort of reason, maybe some sort of sectoral reason why you might adopt cross guaranteeing arrangements. And I must say I was really, really surprised to find um, they were quite common in banks and um, they were less common in things like um, the materials sector as far as proportion of those, those sectors that are listed on the stock exchange. And you know, the, a lot of the really notable large companies have cross guarantees and um, for example Harvey Norman has one. In 2007 they had 1,355 subsidiaries but not all of their subsidiaries were party to the cross guarantee so you can basically choose which companies that you want to be wedded to in terms of if you were liquidated. So which companies you want as part of your, it's called a closed group that's formed once you enter a cross guaranteeing arrangements. And then I'll just quickly skip through to tax consolidation. Tax consolidation is by far more pervasive. In 2007 nearly half of the companies listed on the stock exchange, or over half of the companies listed on the stock exchange uh, had tax consolidation arrangements, which I found a little bit strange. Most companies that had uh, cross guarantees also had entered tax consolidation arrangements. And um, for those of you that don't know, the, the current tax consolidation regime came into force in 2002. And it was interesting to see that companies just bit by bit were coming on board. Um, the idea behind tax consolidation is that it would improve a corporate group's tax profile. Um, I'm not quite sure how it might do that, but it's to do with pushing up and pushing down profits and losses. But the arrangements around that are very complex and apparently overall it required about 800 pages of legislation to enact, enact tax consolidation rules. And I think it's getting worse as we go along. Once again, I had a bit of a, a breakdown for the sectors and you'll see that the um, things like the material sector which didn't have a lot of co uh, closed groups actually was um, far more popular to enter tax consolidation arrangements. Um, I'd really like to get out and talk to some of these companies about why they enter and how they enter these arrangements but I uh, just haven't had a chance yet. So which is um, probably the next thing in um, part of the process. Graham and I have um, applied for a large grant so that uh, we can look at some of these things in far more detail, bring all the material up to date. Most of this uh, material can't be collected any other way than by hand. So as you can imagine, it takes a long time. So um, really that's all I wanted to say today and hopefully you'll have some questions about uh, arrangements to do with tax consolidation and deeds of cross guarantee. I'm getting really wound up at the back here, right? <laughs> so um, I'm going to finish by saying, what's the message today? The message you'll find in the bag. And here it is. And I tried to have a nice analogy between the butcher's scales and the weights when we go into a butcher shop. Do we care how those scales weigh? We don't give a bugger. The mechanism underpinning the scale, but we're surely pretty upset if we take home a pound, a 
pound. That's how old I am, right? A kilo and a half steak, and it's only a kilo when you go and weigh it on your scale, right? What's the analogy with auditing and the output process? We don't care whether you follow the standard as a user. We want to know that what comes out of the process is serviceable. For what? Solvency, liquidity, profitability calculations. That's the only thing that's of interest, and that's why the Companies Act has the true and fair view override. It doesn't care how you do it, but it wants to damn well make sure that the scales are right. Huh? Now, what does that mean? Just very quickly, I mentioned things like AQR. In Australia, we've got an audit quality review that says everything is fine. Treasury document March. Interestingly, June 2010, the UK, similar uh, exercise done by FSA and FR FRC, looking at prudential regulation. What's it say about auditors and banks? Very, very concerned. What about? The lack of professional scepticism in respect of what? Fair value accounting, loan loss provisioning. Charles might have something to say about that, I'm not sure. Two different responses. What could that imply? In Australia, everything was done to Hoyle. Or were we lucky? Not so sure. Or? Question mark. Finally, just on consolidations, in indecent disclosure, we don't say get rid of group accounting. But what we say is consolidation accounting is inadequate and an alternate form of group accounting ought to be provided. In principle, what does that entail? Using XBRL, we would provide to the users all of the subsidiary information, all of the cross loans, all of the revenues and expenses across the companies and let them work it out. Because with XBRL, that's what you can do now. And interestingly, Frank and I aren't XBRL experts, but we know enough about it to know that there's no hindrance now on technology. Of course, there might be a hindrance on proprietary costs, but that goes back to incorporation. If society thinks that corporate groups need to be monitored and governed better, they will impose that cost no matter what the company say. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me, and thank you, Sandra, for providing the data. Thanks, Graham and Sandra. I might ask the panellists to just come up uh, here while I very briefly introduce them, and the format will simply be the panellists and people from the floor can ask questions of Graham and um, questions of Sandra. Very briefly, um, full CVs of the panellists are included in the booklet that you've got. Um, on my extreme left is Charles Littrell. Charles is Executive General Manager at APRA. Um, he is on the advisory board of the faculty with myself and a number of other colleagues and I would immodestly say about Charles he's one of the brightest people I've ever met. Um, Stuart uh, Washington who is in the middle of the table, um, Stuart's a very unusual gentleman, Stuart is an intellectual journalist, uh, no oxymorons intended. Um, <laughs> And to give you an idea of the sort of work he's done, he's done work on Lehman Brothers, um, Storm Financial and Trio Capital, and that's a particular focus of his investigative journalism. He was awarded the Citigroup Excellence Award in Journalism and recently a full year fellowship to study business journalism at Columbia University. Um, intellectual journalists are very rare creatures indeed. Um, also uh, on the panel is Joycelyn Morton. Uh, I had the great pleasure of working with Joycelyn many moons ago. Well, only a few moons ago. I'm sorry, Joycelyn. <laughs> That's very hurtful. Um, at, uh, at Cooper's um, and Librand as it was. Um, Joycelyn's had an outstanding commercial career as a company director and a very senior executive internationally with Shell. And she is a very, very capable uh, executive and very highly regarded in the accounting provision provision. That's, that's absolutely Freudian, isn't it? <laughs> Accounting profession. Um, she has been the national president of CPA and has been um, on the International Federation of Accountants Council for a number of years and has just been elected for another three years there. Uh, without further ado, I will just hand over briefly to the panellists to comment one by one or raise questions with uh, Graham and Sandra and then we'll put it to the floor. Charles, we might start with you for a comment. Uh, I didn't realise you were going to be applying for an APRA licence, you're saying all these nice things. Um, I, I work for the Prudential Regulation Authority. The, um, 
one of the salient issues there in this country, which we regard as the distinct strength of prudential regulation, is um, APRA sets pr uh, accounting rules for prudentially regulated institutions. So if you're a bank or an insurance company, you need to follow not only the public accounting rules, but the APRA rules. Um, and I would say in the recent changes that allow consolidated supervision, we have not followed those. No, we take the view that corporations pay the bills, not groups. Not only dividends, but any other check that gets written is written by a corporation, not by a group. Um, APRA's statutory mission is to balance safety and efficiency in the prudentially regulated sector um, and also to protect the financial stability of the country. We, um, as a practical matter, recognize that conglomerate groups dominate the assets held in the sector but the individual corporate entities in those groups are the ones that actually do the business. Um, if you look at our accounting reporting for banking groups, for example, we collect eight different views on banks. Um, one of the frustrations for us in the ongoing debates about accounting is um, there isn't one view that works for everybody. Um, there does seem to have been this movement in the public accounting to say the, sh the shareholder view is the most important view and it's the day trader shareholder. You know, what's the value today? Uh, we tend to take a creditor view uh, and a longer term view and a distressed view. And so therefore, as Graham mentioned, we disallow a great many assets. We actually allow a few that shareholder based accounting doesn't allow. Um, but what we find is, although it's useful to start from the point of view of the public accounting, uh, it is necessary in our world to make a great many changes. Um, which I think are generally accepted because there is such a divergence of the use of the accounts. From the point of view of a prudential regulator protecting creditors and financial stability, um, one of the great tragedies, uh, when I was taught accounting about the time that Graham was starting in the profession, the, um, we were taught the five principles of accounting. And principle number one was conservatism. I, I believe the institution of accounting prostituted itself when it gave up that principle in favor of we want to value properly for hedge traders and day traders. I mean, what was wrong with the conservatism that IFRS had to give it up? Uh, we see three or four years after that change, you know, the world's accounts were debauched and grossly unconservative. And, um, you know, that's a tragedy. And just to finish on that point, um, we are sometimes asked you know, what use are auditors to prudential regulators. Uh, we hope that the statistical returns that are sent in from institutions are correct, and our rules give auditors a great deal of um, value in that. But it would be fair to say that we don't rely on auditors to tell us there's a problem. Uh, they are terribly conflicted because they're employed by the people who they're supposed to be ratting out. And uh, that just doesn't happen very often. Stuart, I'll let you go last, I think, Joycelyn, if that's yeah. all right. <laughs> Um, I suppose I'd like to uh, underline uh, a couple of points that Graham and Sandra made just in terms of some of the, the consequences that I see of, of the complexity uh, of, of the group accounting structures that we have at the moment. Um, there are two specific examples I'll raise. Uh, one is uh, Allco, um, God rest its soul, um, and it, it was always a, a very complex beast to understand. But I suppose where, where we ended up was that, that it, if I have a minor claim to fame in accounting, it was that I identified that Allco had misstated $1.9 billion in current liabilities, uh, that KPMG, after crawling over Allco's accounts, failed to pick up. And, and so I, I, I wonder what happened, what happened there. Is it, as Charles just said, uh, a case of deeply conflicted auditors? Or, or is it a case of, of, of so much complexity that uh, thinking, as Graham was saying earlier, was left at the door? But in any case, um, we were left in a situation where a mug journalist was telling the public, well, actually, Orco had $1.9 billion more in liabilities due within the next 12 months than what the auditors are telling you. Uh, the second example, and, and I suppose I raise this as a matter of public interest, but I, I, I don't say 
at the outset that there's anything wrong with this. Um, when we looked at Seven Media Group's accounts, uh, Seven Media Group had uh, liabilities outstripping its assets by, by $1.7 billion. Now, Seven Media Group is the corporate entity that holds the joint venture of the Seven Network um, and KKR, a, a large private equity firm. Now, fiendishly difficult to understand, very difficult to interpret, and, and also a venture that's got $1.7 billion in liabil net liabilities, you suddenly say, whoa, what's going on? Um, we were assured by uh, Kerry Stokes that, there were, that within this structure there were debts of, cons uh, debts of real consequence, which uh, presumably means that there were also debts of no real consequence um, in that structure, um, which I find interesting. We eventually identified and reported that there was uh, a, it was a financing structure that gave KKR a tax benefit of something in the order of $635 million over the life of that structure. Now, now Seven doesn't come out and say, or KKR doesn't come out and say, look, you know, we've got a financing structure here that's pretty red hot. You know, it shows $1.7 billion of li net liabilities, but you know, there could be a tax benefit of $635 million. That isn't uh, included in the, in, in the financial statements. It's complexity that, that took us weeks to work through, and, and it's that complexity that I think, uh, if, if I take from Graham and Sandra, that, that is actually self-defeating almost on a, on a public interest basis as well. Joyce, well. Um, first of all, Stuart, can I just say um, I really enjoyed your series on the Where Are They Now? Um, for those who haven't uh, read it, um, it covers the um, current position of a number of our quite uh, esteemed uh, entrepreneurs um, of the last few years, and uh, it was quite fascinating. But it comes to the question, how are people who have lost, how many billion was it? Billions and billions for shareholders within Australia still able to create new companies and keep going and encourage more people to continue to invest in them. But um, so it was a very interesting article. Thank you for that. Um, I believe that one of the reasons why we live in such a complex commercial environment in Australia is due to our tax system. Our tax system is one of the most horrendous and complex systems in the world. When I worked for Shell, uh, the head of tax, the global head of tax was from America. And he came out and uh, he knew quite a lot about Australian tax system. Uh, and we met actually with the commissioner of the time. And, uh, and his comment was, in America we have a complex tax system, but we're complex about the big issues, the issues that really matter. In Australia, your complexity goes to a minutia that is absolutely absurd. So we end up with a tax system that has, you know, what is it, uh, 800 pages to deal with a consolidation system that possibly was required due to um, years of the, the, the tax office and um, various uh, decisions by um, various legal courts or uh, tribunals denying deductibility for items that really should have been deductible. Uh, and so uh, you got to people, uh, uh, an intensity within companies of worrying about, did they have the right structure? Did they have the right expense in the right company? And this, this focus. And so in the end, consolidations was the resolution. That shouldn't have been the resolution. I spent years on the tax law improvement program, but we were told all you can do is rewrite the law in its current policy, you can't change any underlying policy. So how can you change, how can you get a better act if in fact you can't fix the policy issues? And so um, you end up with a consolidation regime that is cumbersome, that is complicated, uh, that is difficult because you didn't fix the initial policy issues in the first place. So, Sandra, I, I can only um, applaud your papers and saying, when you go to your next stage, look at the, under, the fundamental underlying reasons why people created these companies in the first place 
and um, because of stamp duty, income tax, mm -hmm. all of those other taxes within Australia <coughs> that lead us to the position that we're in now. I might um, hand over questions to um, the floor. Uh, I'll have a, a rejoinder that won't answer directly the bit on fraud because uh, I haven't been associated with those cases to know when the fraud wasn't picked up when it should have been. But the issue about complexity, I think it would be uh, remiss if people went away from the room thinking that the complexity now was not complexity in the past. Uh, Wayne Lonigan mentioned to me, I think it might have been a, over a beer a, a week back, about Stanley Corman and the Corman Group in Australia. That was the 1960s, 1961 to 65. I think the inspector's report was 65 or 64. That was an incredibly complex round robin transaction that would really do people proud today. And it's not long back we had Adsteam. And Adsteam was pretty neat because it wasn't wholly owned. It was 49% and 51% uh, with publicly listed companies, all interposed with private companies. And let's not forget Alan Bond with his 600 companies, uh, many of whom were private companies. And of course, it goes on. I can go back to Kruger in America in the 1920s and Insul. The complexity has always been there when we had regulated, unregulated environments. So what that says me, if I go back to my thinking, that's research. It's got nothing to do with regulation, per se, unregulated, regulated, but perhaps the mix or the nature of the regulation's wrong. If you're a doctor and it wasn't working, they wouldn't give you the same medicine. But the latest changes, Clerp 9 socks, they're in the same genre. And, you know, is Sabane's Oxley really going to solve the problems? What good company wouldn't have had internal controls in place? And if it didn't have them in place, it wasn't the problem of the regulator, it was the governance mechanisms, the management weren't doing their job. Or, as you suggest, they want to keep it loose to have fraud. I don't want to think that badly. But I'll let Stuart say something. I'll restrain myself from uh, having a, a almost reflexive kick at the regulators, um, given Charles is sitting at the table. Um, <laughs> and I'm in between. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I, I suppose I'd answer with a, with, with a question, because it's not clear in my mind, but, but when you look at uh, the structures of Alco and, and Babcock and Brown, uh, they were incredible, uh, MFS, um, City Pacific, um, you, you see an incredible complexity, intra-company loans, uh, uh, cross-guarantees, um, and, and I wonder, uh, and I don't know, it, it's interesting that Harvey Norman's got 1,300 subsidiaries, um, but I wonder whether there is a correlation between, between complexity and collapse, and I, I don't know whether that's been picked up, Sandra or Graham. Um, but, but certainly, just on a, on a taste test, you'd have to say, well, there does seem to be a, a predisposition towards complex structures being used to mask things in, a, in an untoward way. Um, the overall answer to that, I don't know. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, simply to say, what couldn't be done by a division that is currently being done by a subsidiary? If you look at Chemex Corporate Groups Report 2000, an incredibly impressive document looking at groups in liquidation, groups ongoing. Chapter two, I think, is a summary of the economic rationale for groups. Most of the rationales for groups no longer exist in Australia because they were driven by tax and uh, workplace relations, uh, ins workers' comp insurance. A lot of the subsidiary companies that are in groups are in groups because of takeovers. And once you take them over, you can't get rid of them because of stamp duty problems. Well, many of those issues could be overcome quickly by government if they perceived the complexity as an issue. And I, I, I repeat the question. What could be done, couldn't be done by a division that is done by a subsidiary? The benefit of the subsidiary is the limited liability, clearly. Well, if you want limited liability in a subsidiary, you shouldn't take up a deed across guarantee because you've negated, supposedly, the limited liability. And yet 60% or whatever the figure was of the top 150 companies have got deeds across guarantee. So they mustn't want limited liability. In 
a previous life, I had occasion to run a consolidation project for a major uh, corporate group. And to follow up on that, I think it's important to emphasize corporations don't create subsidiaries as their first choice. It's always the second best solution, right? I would prefer to keep one company except I need this for tax reasons and that because I'm in a different country and this for regulatory reasons and this for whatever and whatever, whatever. I mean, given their choices, conglomerates don't randomly spawn subsidiaries. But, you know, for the reasons that seem good at the time, they do. Um, it is fair to say that it is much easier to complete to create complexity than it is to get rid of it. Um, and I would say in this country, particularly stamp duty is an extraordinarily pernicious issue. But um, we are stuck with this. And in terms of the first question, I did want to comment that although complexity does facilitate fraud, to me the much more worrisome aspect is complexity creates self-deception. Um, a corporation doesn't understand itself well enough, and the senior executives and board don't understand itself well enough because of all this complexity. And I think actually that over time creates more losses than fraud. Yeah, there has been a bit of work done by that. Uh, John Argenti wrote a book uh, called Corporate Collapse, good title actually, you know, back in 1976. And he was a, um, a managerial consultant, and through his experiences and through uh, case studies, he tried to develop what he called was a A score, which is um, a, a more understandable measure of uh, the Z score, which is the mathematical tool that's used by people to predict companies going into failure. And one of his major elements in his scoring mechanism for the A score was a dominant personality. However, it would be a little bit rash to argue that all companies with a dominant personality are going to get into trouble, either self-deception or fraud. Uh, but there, there is an issue if, as an auditor, it would seem to me, if you have a dominant personality, it's, an Im it's already a red flag for you to do something differently. And I'm not sure whether that is necessarily what is done, but it's certainly in my experience from looking at the cases that I've looked at, not random, perhaps biased, but I would certainly have that as a red flag, I would be looking for different things in my audit. Justice Owen, the snip that we took there, in his public lecture, he addressed that point beautifully. Uh, and I think his view is a reflection 